morning, everybody. So good to see all of you. Happy fourth of the weekend. You get that, don't you? So I've got a few things in store. We're continuing with our first Corinthians. I've got some parties to attend. Some are going to be from my couch watching TV. Some are going to be watching y'all all have fun on your social media things. And I'm going to live life vicariously through you. Is that an agreement? So happy for just to tell you these couple of things as we get started. I hope you have a great weekend and I hope you're safe. I hope that you don't feature yourself on the news in the wrong way. And I hope you share a great memory. Last week we got started in talking about 1 Corinthians, really about the faithfulness of God, because there is no other faithfulness except found in His name. He completes everything He starts. It's such a powerful thought that there's so many projects in my life that I've begun, but I have yet to pull out to completion, right? And there's things that I've started that hopefully a miracle will occur and they'll just finish miraculously all on their own. Some of you have building projects that you can relate to, but part of life is what happens when your whole way of life takes a total and complete change. One of the most tragic events during President Reagan's presidency was this. Sunday morning, a terrorist bombing of the Marine barracks in Beirut. Hundreds of Americans, they were killed and wounded really as they slept. Some of y'all remember this from the news. Some of you have seen it in pictures. Many of you recall the terrible scenes as survivors helped to dig out their friends and some of their brothers beneath all the rubble. I read about this story. Marine Corps Commandant Paul Kelly, he had visited some of the wounded survivors that were taken to Frankfurt, Germany. And in this hospital, he found among them Corporal Jeffrey Lee Nashton. He was severely wounded from the incident that had occurred this moment. And Nashton had so many tubes running in and out of his body that a witness said that he really looked more like a machine than he did a human. But yet, there he was, breathing and surviving. As Kelly neared him, Nashton struggling to move, he was filled with so much pain in his body he motioned for a piece of paper and a pen, and he simply wrote a brief note and passed it back to the commandant. And on the slip of paper were but two words, Semper Fi. The Latin motto of the Marines that means always faithful. With these two simple words, Nashton spoke volumes to the millions of us in America who sacrificed the body and the limbs that they had had for their country. And those who did so remained faithful. You see, this weekend, and all the days that go on through my life and for my family, I think it is incumbent upon me. That's my big word of the day. Do y'all like that big word? I'm going to celebrate Jesus and the country he gave us. I love being an American. There's nothing wrong with being an American. And I want you all to know, for those of you watching online and here today, we're going to celebrate Jesus because what did Jolie just have with the choir? This is the land God gave us and we're going to call upon him to protect us and bless us all at the same time. Amen? Let's go to the Lord in prayer and we're going to dive into scripture. Father, you are always faithful and right now I ask, I wonder about our hearts. Lord, you know the faithfulness we share and you know the faithfulness that we have together. We certainly need your help. There's those that need healing. Those who have gone in procedures and they need a recovery and strength and compassion for the caretakers. There are those at home. Those traveling. And Father, for many, celebrating the fourth, this freedom that we have been given by you. There are those who gave family members, who gave their all. And I ask for compassion, mercy, and grace on them in a special way this day. So Lord, we celebrate you. We celebrate the land you gave us and the country that we're in. And I ask a special help from your word that you'll change us from the inside out so that we can continue to live for you. I pray that prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, the title of this message is The Message. 
It's pretty simple. I believe that no matter what you do, no matter where you are, you speak a message. It can be a positive one. It can be a negative one. It can be one of indifference. And the truth is, we have a message to give. And so last week, we started looking at what a church is. So you see, church isn't a building. And we learned that through COVID, didn't we? It wasn't just about these four walls. The church is a group of people. We've chosen to worship in this sanctuary. And what's so powerful is that Paul described what God sees in the church. And he's going to finish everything he started. But now we transition and how man sees the church. And how what people look at when they see you. Not just in here. But in a store. In schools. In your workplaces. In your neighborhoods. And so Paul starts with something that our world cannot achieve. Only through God can we have it. It's this special word called unity. Look at verse 10 out of 1 Corinthians chapter 1. It says, I plead with you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you speak the same thing. That there be no divisions among you, but that you perfectly join together in the same mind, in the same judgment. It has been declared to me concerning you, my brethren, that those of Chloe's household, that there are contentions among you. Now I say this, that each of you, I am Paul, I am Apollos, I'm Cephas, I'm of Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? Now, I know some of you, when you read this, you're thinking, what is the deal? Let me tell you a little bit about church. If you're new this morning, you're watching online, church people are normal people. We have the same problems that everybody else has. And when you gave your heart to Jesus, it did not make you immune to the utter craziness. That's a Baptist word. Do you like that? That all people tend to share. People have opinions. One thing I've learned over time is not everybody's opinion is correct, but they got them. And here's another thing. When you get two or more gathered, you're going to have drama. Because with some people, in the absence of drama, they create it because they don't know how else to live life. Can I get an amen? Now, I need a little energy from you. So we're going to go into this and have some fun. Y'all ready, everybody? My first point is this. We have several messages to give. Our first message is that we are unified. This is one of the messages that only a believing church, a church that is in fellowship with Jesus Christ, not every church is unified. I'll tell you, not every Baptist church is unified. Boy, I've been to a few, and I want you to know, Not all of them are like Lloyd. Praise the Lord. Here's the deal. Lloyd is a special place. And we have an opportunity to tell others what we're like so that they can see. Now, one of the most important testimonies that a church can give is that there's no divisions among us. Now, because people have opinions, because people have preferences, they misread the idea of divisions. They think they have to agree, or better yet, you've read the news this day. It's not enough for you to agree with them. You have to support them out loud, don't you? You can't have a sermon with me without the mention of food. Is that agreed? I just want to make sure everybody feels comfortable. Well, today we're going to change it. You ready? I love sports. I really do. I think sports is a wonderful thing. I think if everybody could play a sport, they ought to do it. Here's the situation, though. You'll have some people who say American football is the greatest sport. And then somebody else will follow up and go, "Uh uh-uh, baseball, that's the best sport. No, no, basketball. And you can do the list on and on and on. And in this day and age, it's not enough for you to go, I think American football is the best. And somebody goes, well, good for you. Not anymore. We live in a life that goes, "Uh uh-uh. You need to agree with me wholeheartedly. You need to abandon the sport you love and totally agree with me in every facet. That's not what Paul's writing. Paul is writing by saying, let's keep the main thing the main thing. He doesn't regard certain things as important as others do. He regards the main thing is Jesus Christ him crucified, and from that we can have a conversation. 
So the situation is this. Because of all these divisions, we need to understand something. Don't let it said that as church people, people know what we're against more than we are what we're for. And unfortunately, because we're church people, but because we're human, you'll often learn what we're anti as opposed to what we're pro. You ready, folks? I'm pro-Jesus. How about you? I love singing. I really don't care what songs we sing. I think we ought to mix it up. I think we ought to have more fellowships at church. You know why? Because we're better together around fried chicken. There's my food. Amen. You see, what's so important is though keeping the main thing the main thing and letting all the other issues that might bother you severely stop bothering you because you gave it over to the Lord. Here's Paul. He says, why are there quarrels or contentions among you? You know why? He's asking this because factions, cliques, they're getting started. If you get a couple of people together, it's easy to develop a group called a clique. Many of you in Lloyd, I want you to know if you're watching online, I have a true testimony to give. I'm not from Lloyd. I don't have a whole lot in common with Lloyd as in I'm not a farmer. I really don't like grass. And you can take that all kinds of meanings. Amen? Some of y'all will get that later. And I've never hunted a day in my life. Our associate pastor had to catch the fish, give it to me so he could take my picture like I caught it. You with me, everybody? Now, I say that to understand something, though. This is a group of believers that the moment I moved down here had accepted me with a wide range of emotion and totally, totally just embraced you see, that's what a church is supposed to be, is to be wide open going, we know you have stuff in your life. We love you. Come on in. You're crazy. We're crazy. Let's just be crazy together. But we care about Jesus. And so the problem was, Paul said, there's a problem with the factions and the cliques and all of these things. And so one answer is that the people of Corinth were worshiping Jesus with their mind and not the brand new heart they gave them. They were making it all about the brain instead of the faith. In other words, they were walking by sight and not by faith. And there's a problem. When you walk by sight, everybody has to agree with you. They start saying things like, well, I don't know if God wants you to do that because that, well, that, that doesn't make any good sense. Let me tell you about Jared Day sense in case you're new. Jared Day and godly sense aren't always the same. I've talked to myself out of doing many a God thing. How about you, right, ladies and gentlemen? So one of the things that would happen is if they couldn't explain the miracle or the power of God in their life, they began to dismiss it. And one of the problems that Christians share is that we try to explain God's holy word when we dismiss things. We try to explain God's word based on how we feel or what it means to me. You've been a part of that Bible study, hadn't you? Well, that's a good scripture. Let me tell you what I think it means. Let me tell you how this one makes me feel. You know, the problem with scripture making me feel certain things like this is it doesn't allow me to do it. Let me explain. Do you know that gluttony is a sin? Boy, I hate talking about this. Because later on, somebody's going to see me at a buffet and I'm ruined. Y'all ready? But what happens in Bible is we'll tend to read it and go, well, let me tell you how that makes me feel. Not good, so I just won't read it anymore. Paul was addressing the main thing, the main thing. People were reading God's word and taking what they liked and throwing away the rest. One of the problems that that happens is that their lives aren't changed by Jesus. They try to change the church for them. So why are there quarrels? Why is there contentions among them? Another answer is that humans like following other humans. You know what I mean? I like famous people. Love them. Well, then I love everybody. Right, everybody? But we like some famous folks. Man, when they come and grace our presence. The other day I met somebody, didn't know who they were. Somebody came behind me and said, did you know who that is? I said, Bob. 
I don't know. Well, they're this, that, and the other. Great. You know, I didn't get it. But in their world, it became special. I remember when I met a professional athlete, an actor that made more than a dollar a show. I remember when I met somebody in the business culture that did something for me. And I came home, and it's amazing how your moms, your dads, your friends, your family, they don't get what you thought was special, how humbling it is. And I said, Mom, Dad, I met this great person. My mom goes, oh, that's good. Did you clean your room yet? You see what I mean, folks? One of the issues that we have as humans is that we like to talk about other people in our life as if they're the change in our life. But that's the problem, isn't it? I've never met a celebrity that took a personal interest in changing my life. I've never met a politician other than maybe the ones we have in our church. Shameless plug. Did you like that? That was good, wasn't it? I've never met a personal politician in which they wanted to personally change my life for the better day in and day out. I'm sure they exist. I'm positive that they do. But don't you see, if we hang our hat on them, here's the problem. Paul said that the more famous that people are, the more important we feel that is a problem. You know, in sports, a coach is often given better opportunities because he coached under some other famous coach. A lawyer is often given better opportunities because they clerked under the right judge or they went to the right school or they had the right professors at some level in their life. We can point out to others when we hang out with all these successful people that we associated with them and we try to tell one another that we're better people just having been around that individual. But don't you see, ladies and gentlemen, unless they lead you closer to Jesus, none of that is actually true. If you want to be a better person, then you live for Jesus because only He can make you better. And then when you get a person who's living for Jesus, and let's say, because we're here on a Sunday morning, you come to church on a Sunday morning with somebody else who wants to be better because of Jesus, that fulfills Scripture. We're better together. We're better together. Now, you might think this is a little crazy, but this is true too. An unfortunate incident occurs at church as well. See, with the right education, right school internships, under the right pastors, as a pastor, I can get in any earthly Christian door I want if my name is associated with the right Christian people. That's a problem. That's a problem. You might think this is crazy, but as people... We tend to identify with spiritual leaders on TV that we've never met. We'll go, do you like pastor so-and-so? And you'll say, oh, yes. Oh, I love it, dear. It just, it just feeds me. Then you ask about the other pastor. No, I don't like pastor such-and-such such because I don't like the way they talk or I don't like the way they teach. I don't get fed. I don't know if you know this, but we all share or should the same Bible, God's holy word. And so the message is actually supposed to be the same. Jesus Christ alone can save you. And anything else becomes hogwash. That's my Lloyd word. Did you like that one too? Oh, come on, everybody. I worked on that one. But here's the situation. Somebody will come through and they attribute it to music, Sunday school. They attribute it to cooking Who's cooking on a Wednesday night? Oh, I don't know if I can show up at that one. Oh, such and such is cooking. I'll be there. You know what? It's food. It's all good if you eat it. Lloyd, shameless plug. But this is the problem Paul was addressing. People in church began choosing a person. They began choosing a style. They began choosing those things over Jesus and his word. See, the pastor is supposed to have the message of God. And the worship leader is supposed to lead others to worship God. And the good news that only Jesus can bring. And in the early church, what was happening is that people were talking about the messengers instead of the message. And that's so easy for people to do. 
It's so easy to focus on the presentation rather than what's being presented. If you want better teaching, and you should, then pour into the teacher to do his teaching. If you want your cooking to be better, do you know what you do? You cook more with other people. I learn more scripture when I'm around other people. I love Wednesday nights when we do the audience parts and people participate in life. But it began to think about these early messengers. Uh, instead of focusing on them, we should focus on the message. I wonder for those who listen to Christian music, do you ever really listen to the words? Or do you often look at what's on TV about what they're dressed in or their video budget might have been? Are you captivated by the lights and the fog? Before you get too judgmental for those who don't like the new contemporary types of music, I thought about this one. Do you really like some of the hymns we sing? If you sing songs like I Surrender All, did you actually mean it? Or did you really want to follow Jesus wherever he leads? Is it really well with your soul? Or is that just something you're telling yourself hoping that it'll latch on? See, Paul didn't mind that Peter, Apollos, he didn't mind himself leading others to Christ. Of course, that's what he was about. He wanted you to come and hear the teaching that they taught about Jesus. I mean, Paul was the minister who founded the church at Corinth. He wanted people to be saved. He wanted them to be baptized. He wanted them to be changed. But his concern was that instead of emphasizing the messenger, he wanted them to hear the message of the word of God. They got their eyes off the Lord and they placed them on the Lord's servants. And that led to comparison. Is Christ divided, he asks. And in this division, he began to ask something like this because it's absurd. We don't cut Jesus up into different portions and go, uh, I'll take a hand. I'll take a spleen. I just want Jesus' heart. I'd like Jesus' brain. And you can go on and on, but here's the point. You might ask, how did all these Corinthians, since they just met Jesus, how would they be like this? Well, look no further than the Jews. They were given ten laws, and out of that came four different types of doctrinal faith the day that Jesus was there. They had the Pharisees, Sadducees, the Essenes, and they had the Zealots. Do you know what they were like? Some of them threw out the entire Old Testament except the first five books of the Bible. Some were really orthodox. Don't you be working on the Sabbath, amen? Here's the other ones. The other ones wanted to use religion to overthrow the government, and all of that came out of the Jewish faith. So the Corinthians came along. All they knew was what they had been told. So I hung out with Paul. I hung out with Apollos. I saw Jesus preach one time. And don't you see, people will name drop like crazy if it gets you to like them. Let me set you free. You ready, ladies and gentlemen? Especially for younger people. Jesus loves you just the way you are. But his love is so great, he refuses to leave you the way he found you. And so because of that, when you have the God who created you, loves you completely, His love is enough for you and me. His love is enough for you and me. You don't have to name drop to get me to like you because when Jesus loves you, you know we do too. Amen? Now, I don't know who the people were at the house of Chloe. But they did something unique. I got to talk about their courage and their devotion. They decided not to hide the problems. One of the problems that churches have is we're not real transparent. When I go visit a brand new prospect at church, they'll ask me, they'll say, well, tell me about uh, a problem at your church. And as a pastor, I find myself creatively lying to them. Do you like this? We're... First Baptist Church of Lloyd. We don't have any problems. You know that's false. So what do you do? You tell the truth. You pick the one socially thing. 
I'll tell you, we do have a problem. There's just simply not enough desserts on the menu. And I'm hoping you'll come to Lloyd and fix that. Amen? But you see, folks, this is the problems that were there, is that nobody was talking about the issues at hand. And so those at Chloe's household decided to write Paul a message and say, there's a problem. And one of the snags in life is that some people in life begin to think, well, your problem is your business. I don't want to get into your business. But here's the situation. As the pastor of a church, I might not be able to fix your problem if I don't know about it. Agreed? Your deacons, your Sunday school teachers, your leadership as a whole, they can't help fix problems if you don't explain to them what the problem is. Now, don't get me wrong. Nobody likes a gossip or a tattletale, but this was causing people to lose their faith. And so let that be a defining line for you. Does Jared, does the other leaders, do they need to know something? Yeah, it is something that they need to know when the person is walking away from Christ. But if it's your opinion, I might not need to know that. Would you agree with that, church? When churches backstab and gossip, they're always going to make the problem worse, not better. If you ever think that churches don't have issues, I always relate to the story of a stranded traveler. You know the story. He was all by himself on an island. And when he was rescued, there were three huts found on his island. And they asked the question, what is that hut? And he said, well, that's my home. Oh, well, what is that hut? Well, well, that was my church. Oh, well, what's the other hut? Well, that was my new church. I didn't get along with the other one. You see, folks, that's the issue that we have is that often when people get what is called disenchanted with something, a click starts. Name dropping occurs. People lose faith. Our church is supposed to point you to Jesus, not take your eyes off of it. So Paul asks, with all of these things, what's our message? Unity. And since our message is unity, we're all different. We all have different opinions. And I've learned, as I said earlier, that just because someone has an opinion doesn't make them right. But as saints of God, we have the same God. We have the same spirit, the same word. It is the fulfillment of truth. You need to know that since other people are comparing other people to other people, Peter to Paul, Apollos to Christ, Paul said, how do you fix this issue? This is the important part. This is our entire message. How do you fix the unity of a church? Well, you got to start calling each other brethren. Paul said, you might fight with your family, but at the end of the day, you're supposed to mend the fences with your family. If you've got a brother or a sister who you haven't talked to in years, i got to ask you why. That might be the only brother and sister you have. You got a mom and a daddy. If you hadn't talked to them in years, why? Now, don't get me reason. I mean, don't get me lost. I know there's tons of reasons. And some of y'all were treated unbelievably poorly in your family. But see, at church, we're called a faith family. And we're supposed to set the standard for all the people in life to follow. When they look at your family and how you get along, the question ought to be, hey, how come y'all like each other so much? You're supposed to point to Jesus. How come you get along? I got to tell you, it, it's Jesus. Because if it was up to me, we wouldn't be getting along. Well, how come your church is different? Jesus. Jesus. It's not you, it's not me, but we're better together because of Jesus. And so what do you do? You start calling each other brethren. When you call each other a brother and a sister, when they become a family to you, you begin to treat them a lot nicer than you would a stranger. Over the years, because of sickness and disease, it seems like we keep more than just a six-foot radius. We try to keep people an aisle away. 
But in church, the way we best help one another is by treating them like family. How do you want to be treated? That's how we ought to treat others. So we call each other brethren. The next is perfectly joined together. How do you fix the unity of the church? Perfectly joined together. I'm not a doctor, but I did stay at a Holiday Inn once. Did y'all like that? It's a medical term. This is a medical term. This medical term means that the body was knit together in such a perfect way that my arm is exactly where it's supposed to be and not somewhere else. And so when you begin to think that every single person at church was brought here by God and brought for a wonderful reason, I think it's more exciting to find out why you're here and what you're going to do for God rather than look at what you're not doing for God. You see, what's so important is that for many of you, you over the years that you've gotten, shall we say, seasoned, some of y'all are smiling at me because you know what that means. When your body begins hurting, I don't think your first thought is, well, just cut it off. I'd be a lot better without that foot, hand, eyeball, spleen. Your thing is you want to go to the doctor and get it fixed, don't you? Why is my arm not working? Let's make it work. Any of y'all have ever had back trouble? You know what that's like. Fix my back, doc. I can't even breathe, right? Have a bruised rib. It'll appreciate your lungs. You see, what's so powerful is that God made your body to work together for his glory. God made this body just the way he likes it to work perfect for his glory. How do you fix unity? Begin looking at one another thinking you're here for a reason. Now, I don't yet know what that reason is, but I can't wait to find out what that purpose is. We're the church. And unless it's a cancer or a disease, we're not going to cut you out. And because we're a church, we call upon the name of Jesus. How do you fix the unity? Call on Jesus. He's the only thing that can change our life. Instead of calling a friend... Instead of calling some resource, the first avenue that you take is Jesus. Jesus, what do you want me to say? What do you want me to do? How do you want me to proceed? What is the purpose? I know I'm going through something. How can I give you glory while doing it? Now, I have a special treat for all of you today. You ready for my happy 4th of July treat? You know all those sermons that I've run over for years? Oh, come on. You know all those sermons. All those wonderful children moments. Here's my present to you. You ready? I'm done. But my last challenge must be extended as we go into a time of invitation. One of the first messages we have is about unity. And unless we treat each other like family, and that they're here for a reason, You're never going to have the unity that you're supposed to have under the name of Jesus. For every child that you've had born in your family, my hope is as a good mama, daddy, aunt, uncle, cousin, relative, you would look at that child and go, man, I'm glad they're here. And so on behalf of First Baptist Church of Lloyd and God's Holy Word, I'm glad you're here. And I can't wait to see what the days go through to find out why God brought you and I here together. So as we close, as we sing this song, do you know Jesus? I mean, have you really met Jesus Christ? Because without Him, you don't have any unity in your life, much less your family or faith family. There really is a Jesus. He really did give Himself for you and for me. This morning, for those of you who have met Jesus, the challenge must be asked, how's the unity in your own family at home? Do you need to go home and call somebody this forth and go, hey, I hadn't talked to you in so long, but right here, right now, we need to chat. I just want to ask your forgiveness or I want to give them forgiveness. 
If you want to celebrate independence, then ask Jesus to set you free from the sin and the guilt and all the drama that you've been carrying for years and just say, God, take over. I promise you, this would be the best 4th of July ever if you give your life to Christ. Let's pray together. Father, the message we have is to live